Hi, my name is Dan Ring, and in this tutorial, I'm going to go back to basics and show you exactly how to spot problems with your tracks and figure out what your track is doing. This is the first step in correcting bad tracks, which we're going to look at in later tutorials. In the last tutorial, we created a couple of tracks, one in particular on the girl's nose. To judge how good the track was, we were looking at the zoom window here and scrubbing back and forth in the timeline to see a nice steady image. This way, you can very quickly see when the track is drifting. Another way to get the same stabilize effect is to use this center viewer button here. As the name suggests, this centers the viewer around all of the selected tracks. So you can see here, the viewer, the entire viewer now, is locked to this selected track. The nice thing about using the center viewer option is that we get to see the rest of the picture as well as the stabilized tracks. And also, if we select multiple tracks, we get to see the average, the stabilized average, of both of these tracks. For a more dedicated way to stabilize the image, we can use the tracker's own Transform Stabilize option, or else we can create a corner pin or Transform Stabilize nodes from the Export menu here. Looking at stabilized image data is one of the best ways to gauge how well your track is doing. Another very good way is to look at the error values of a track. To show you what I mean, I'm going to start a track and then pause it halfway through. If we zoom in to the bottom left hand corner of the search reticle, we can see this magic error value here. The error value measures the image difference between the pattern window at the current frame, so frame 165, and the track's pattern window at the original frame, frame 149. So if the object doesn't change appearance much over time, we expect the error to be quite low. A high error either means that the object has changed appearance a lot, or that the track has gone wrong somewhere. The tracker actually records the error values for all tracked frames. So what we can do now is go into the curve editor and look at our error curves for our track. The thing to note about this error curve, which is typical of most error curves, is that it starts out at around zero, and then gradually increases as the track goes on. And we expect this sort of behavior, as most interesting objects change appearance over time. And this error value measures the change in appearance from our grab frame and our current frame. Things really start to get interesting when we start trying to figure out what these high error value peaks, like here, and especially here, correspond to in our actual image. So let's keep this curve editor window open here in the corner, while we see what these peaks correspond to in our actual image. We can scrub quickly along the timeline by dragging this vertical yellow bar. And let's move it over to our first peak. Looking at the error value here for frame 165, we can see that it's about half that of the maximum error for this shot. So what that means is that we expect the image patch in this frame to be fairly different from the image patch we originally grabbed at frame 149. And we can verify this by just quickly increasing the keyframe window size. And true enough, we can see that the two patches are fairly different. We can see here on the right, at frame 149, that part of the ear is occluded, and then uncovered here at frame 165. Let's move on to our next peak. I think at this one, we should see a dramatic difference between our original frame and our current frame. As we expected, the two image patches are very different, even more so than the last time. For example, the hair is no longer occluding the ear as it was in our original example. And we're also no longer tracking the center of the ear as we were, we're now tracking slightly to the left. So the difference between these two image patches is what gives us our high error value here in the curve editor. You now see how you can use the curve editor to spot problems in the tracks by looking at the error curves. But this only gives us part of the picture. What we want to do is get a better idea of how the track is doing over time, where it's drifting, and by how much. And more importantly, we want all of that in the viewer. To see this, we can toggle on this new switch called the Show Track Error button. The error is now shown on the animation path of the track, in terms of traffic light colors, where red means high error and green means low error. So if we scrub along, we can see instantly how the track is doing. 
For example, at our high peak, we can see the values are red. And at our original peak at 165, we can see that it's more orange. But closer to our original frame at 149, it's more green. One thing to remember here is that there's no objective way to say if a given error value is good or bad. This means that a red color might mean that one track is proceeding nicely, but for another track it means that it's failed. For example, if we go back to frame 200 and look at this red point here, the image patches are quite different, as we saw earlier. But if we now go back and look at track 1, we can see that if we go to the regions where the track has turned red, the image patches are still quite similar. So even though this is red, it doesn't necessarily mean that the track has failed or that there's a problem. It just means that this is the highest error value that we've seen so far for this track. In this tutorial, I've shown you the four main ways of diagnosing track quality using the zoom window, the center viewer window, the curve editor, and the traffic light warning system. Being able to quickly spot when and why a track failed is extremely useful and ends up saving you a lot of time in the future. And on top of that, it'll help you get the most out of the new keyframe-based tracking workflow that we're going to present in the next tutorial. Hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching.